further ado, Daniel. Well, I'm going to try without the microphone, if that's all right. You can all hear me. Great. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the Freedom Association for putting this fantastic event together. I, in common with a number of you, am thinking nostalgically of some of the happy party conferences that we used to have in this town before the Conservative Party conference became a trade fair for lobbyists and bureaucrats. Yes. And it is wonderful to be able to come somewhere where what used to be the bread and butter business of a political conference, namely the members coming and discussing ideas, can happen in an agreeable and pleasant atmosphere. So yeah. it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, Real, always a pleasure to be uh, supporting the Freedom Association, the first organisation I joined was the Freedom Association. I was 16 before I joined the Conservative Party. And it's nice, I very rarely get outside my patch. I represent the South East, I have 84 constituencies there. They tend to keep me busy, but it occurred to me on my way here that this really ought to be in my patch, of course, because Bournemouth <laughs> was always part of Hampshire until it was ripped therefrom by the levelling, rationalist enthusiasts of the Heath government. It was our nadir as a country that they presumed to be bigger than everything that had come before in terms of the currency, in terms of the counties, it could only have been such a mentality that sold our birthright and took us into the European Union. Well, I don't want to talk so much about the, the, the foreign affairs crises and flashbacks because there is a wealth of expertise. I, uh, I'm a friend of all three of the other gentlemen on the panel and they will be able to talk much more uh, in depth and with far more detail about Ukraine and Syria and so on than I could. Let me in the brief time I have, put forward the idea that the waning of Western power is a symptom of something else, that Ukraine and Syria and all the other examples of where governments around the world see the prestige of Western countries waning and make the rational calculation to sidle up to some altogether less wholesome authoritarian governments is happening as the result of a tilting of power of a shift in scales of which we are the authors through the, polit uh, the, the political and economic structures that we've created. Join me, if you will, in a little thought experiment. Imagine that you were a visitor from another planet, circling this planet 500 years ago, peering from the porthole of your flying saucer at the fragile blue globe suspended in space. Where would you have been interested in? What would you have assumed would be the dominant civilization of the next half millennium? I put it to you that your eye would have been drawn to the great monarchies of Asia, to the Ming and Mughal and Ottoman empires. And you'd have looked in wonder at the extraordinary advances that they had technologically. Their gunpowder their paper money, their canals, their ships, their cartography, their mathematics, their astronomy. You would have assumed <laughs> that this was going to be the dominant civilization for the human species. Your eye might then have rested briefly in passing on the broken, scattered peoples at the western tip of the Eurasian landmass. You would have assumed that they would be the colonizers. You would have assumed that China would have sailed around Africa to discover Portugal, rather than the other way around. Now, why didn't that happen? What was the secret of the Western economic miracle? Well, here I can't pretend to be advancing an original theory. I'm borrowing from an Australian historian <coughs> called Eric Jones, although his thesis was taken to a much wider audience by Paul Kennedy in his rise and fall. The magic of our part of the world is precisely that it never became an empire. It never became a uniform, centralized, taxed, bureaucratized, single state, but rather remained a diverse plurality of competing states. Lots of different territories and Princetons, each striving to outdo the other, free to innovate, to pilot new ideals, to... to, to, to to trial new schemes, each free to copy what worked in its neighbours. And that competition fostered a unique culture of enterprise and adventure and led ultimately to the economic takeoff that created the hegemony of Western values 
which we're still living through. Now, I'm sure you've guessed where I'm taking this argument. <laughs> it is the tragedy of our generation that just at the moment when the great civilizations of Asia have learnt the benefits of decentralization, diffusion, devolution, democratization, that Europe is going in the other direction. That we are going down the Ming, Mughal, Ottoman path to higher tax and higher regulation and more bureaucracy and the stifling of innovation. You don't find many mandarins in Peking anymore, but you find plenty of them in Brussels, closed past, determined by their ideological outlook, <clears throat> chosen almost in a way designed to stifle new thinking. And that is our generational tragedy. The year that we joined the European Union, 1973, Western Europe accounted for 36% of the world economy. Today, that figure is 23%. In 2020, it'll be 15%. Why has that happened? Because if you take away the stimulus of competition, you become flabby, you become uncompetitive, you become self-seeking, and you lose the innovation, the enterprise, that is the motor of growth. In a way, the European Union takes, removes the things, all the motors that drive expansion, economic expansion. A country, a government, is constrained by external competition. You can raise your taxes up to a certain point, then the money starts going abroad. And you find that you have to cut them if you want to have any revenue at all. But of course, if you're in the European Union and you don't want to have that uh, decision, you can export your tax rates to your competitors through tax harmonization. You can give your workers as a government the most generous entitlements, holidays and maternity leave and paternity leave and all the rest of it. Up to a certain point, then the factories start moving towards friendly jurisdictions. But if you're in the European Union, you can use the political and legal mechanisms of Brussels to export your costs to your competitors. And that is our tragedy. I write a blog for the Daily Telegraph, as does Charles Archer. <coughs> and I made a throwaway comment the other day. I said, every continent on the planet is now growing economically, except Antarctica and Europe. <laughs> a Spanish friend of mine got in touch very crossly, and he sent me a wealth of statistics, and I had to accept that his data were completely convincing. He proved beyond doubt that Antarctica is doing fine. <laughs> The economy is rebounding in line with everybody else's. We are trapped in the only customs union on the planet that is declining. And that, my friends, is no place for an island people who make their way in the world by what they buy and sell. One last observation. A little news item that you may have missed. Last month, it was announced that the European Union has shelved <coughs> its trade talks with India. At the same time, the European Free Trade Association, Norway, Iceland, Switzerland, and Liechtenstein, <coughs> are proceeding without any problems and expect a comprehensive FTA to be signed with India this year. Now, given that India grew at 4.6% in 2012, while the European Union shrank by 0.3% and the euro is owned by 0.9%, where would you rather be? And we, of all countries, as a trading maritime nation, lose because of the collective protectionism that we're dragged into at EU level. Which country has more to gain from free trade with that mighty giant than this one? India is a common law democracy. It has the same legal system that we do, the same commercial and accountancy practices. It is, for business purposes, an English-speaking country. There are 1.4 million Britons of Indian origin. India is the fourth largest investor in the United Kingdom. It owns Techly and Jaguar and a hundred other companies less well known. But we can't sign an FDA with India or with anyone else. We gave that power to Brussels on the day that we joined, the 1st of January, 1973. 
send the Mayor of London and the Chancellor off to China to talk about the, what the media cretinously call trade. But of course, they can't sign an FTA. They can't talk about tariff reductions or mutual product recognition, so they end up talking about Downton Abbey because that's the only thing <laughs> <laughs> it's there. Yeah. My friends, this is no place for us as <coughs> We do not sit on great natural resources here. We have to make our way in the world. And that means being where the customs are. If we get the economics right, <coughs> politics will follow. And instead of the waning of the West, instead of this Tolkienian fading of the Eldar, we can still look forward to a united, English-speaking-led world, the Anglosphere peoples, exerting their benign pull on humanity for another century. It's up to us. We carry on down the existing road, then we will indeed fade and come to the West. But if we get the economic revival, buttressed by free trade with the other English-speaking democracies, then the future could yet be bright.